Okay, hello everybody. Um, welcome to the session on cinematic design, the first one. So my name is Christian Rechberger and I will be chairing the session. We're going to have three talks in this session. Uh, the first one is titled From Fafalle to Megafono via Seminion, the PRF Hydra and uh, for MPC applications. Um, it's authored by Lorenzo Grassi, uh, Martin Oegarden, uh, Markus Schofnecker and Roman Walch. And Roman is going to give the talk. The floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. So welcome from my side as well. So let's, try it, uh, uh, let's start right away. So in the recent decade or so, a new area of um, cryptography has become increasingly more important, namely the area where we can compute on encrypted or unknown data. So for example, we have homomorphic encryption where we can directly compute on ciphertext. We have multi-party computation where a set of parties compute the function on their combined input without leaking anything about the private inputs to other parties. And we also have zero knowledge proof where you can um, prove the valid validity of some statements without leaking any witnesses. And it, it turns out that for all of these uh, new protocols and primitives, uh, we can construct use cases where we can actually use symmetric primitives in there. However, we cannot really use traditional symmetric primitives like uh, AES or SHA-3 because they were usually designed uh, to be efficient either in software and hardware. And for these protocols, we have a completely different cost metrics. So on, on one hand, in these protocols, we usually work over some um, larger prime fields. Um, um, uh, symmetric designs should then also be uh, defined over larger prime fields to be efficient in these um, protocols. And also the cost in these protocols uh, is usually related to the, the multiplications in the design, and this is something uh, for which the traditional symmetric designs were not optimized for. So symmetric uh, cryptographers had a new uh, area where they could design primitives for. So in this talk, I will mainly focus on uh, multi-party computation and more specifically on use cases where we have potentially large amounts of data and we want to encrypt them in MPC with a secret shared key. So we have a set of uh, uh, computing parties and no uh, MPC party on its own knows the, the, the symmetric key, but they all have a share on the key, but they still can use MPC protocols to encrypt large amounts of data. So for example, this can be useful in when um, the data provider is uh, not a computing party and you can use symmetric primitives and symmetric encryption to efficiently transport this data into the MPC protocol. Another example for use case would be uh, if you have a large MPC computation, you can use encryption <coughs> to efficiently halt the computation and uh, continue at the later point. Or also you can use this uh, for, for key management. For example, you can split your encryption key uh, into shares and uh, use MPC to encrypt your data to, to make it harder for, for attackers to actually steal your key since uh, on each individual machine you are only operating on the share of the key. So these are the, the main use cases we are focusing on in this paper. And there have been many um, symmetric primitives already designed in the literature which try to be efficient in uh, these or similar use cases. For example, we have MIMC, GMIMC, Hades MIMC, Rescue, and Siminian. And the cost metric um, for which these um, symmetric primitives were optimized for is usually minimizing the um, total number of multiplications in the design. So let's have a look at the Siminian um, symmetric um, cipher. This was published um, two years ago here at Eurocrypt, and you can see it here on the slides on the right side. And how it, uh, so Siminian is based on the uh, modified version of the Farfalla design strategy, and it is characterized by two different permutations. Uh, so on one hand, you have the permutation here on the left, uh, which is a, um, the basically applied to the input of the, uh, of the cipher, and this is a more expensive permutation. And the output of this permutation is then fed into um, uh, significantly cheaper permutations called PE here. And the, this uh, cheaper permutation produce a key stream, which is then used to encrypt the actual plain text. And what is so uh, nice about Siminian is that um, since we uh, only apply this more expensive permutation once and then for, for producing the key stream we use the output of this permutation in uh, cheaper um, permutations, um, that means that the more data we actually encrypt in MPC, the more efficient Siminian gets. So the cost of this more expensive permutation is amortized over a large um, amount of encrypted data. However, Siminian also has a, a slight problem, and that is that its security analysis relies on that, that the round keys, which are added before each of these more uh, cheaper permutations, so that these round keys are actually produced by a very expensive hash function. 
And that also means that when we have a symmetric key that is shared in MPC and we want to encrypt some large amounts of data, we also have to compute this more expensive key schedule in MPC. So Simenon is only efficient in use cases where we don't have to compute this key schedule. So this brings us directly to the goal of our work. We want to design an MPC-friendly symmetric cipher that is efficient, uh, as efficient as Simenian, but without this expensive key schedule. And what we came up with is a new design strategy which we call Megaphono, and we instantiate it with, uh, um, uh, to, to get the PRF Hydra, and we, similar to Simenian, we use it as a, a, a stream cipher to encrypt the data in MPC. So let's now uh, dive directly into the design itself. So here on the slides, you can now see um, the PRF Hydra. So it is, uh, looks intimidating at first, but uh, I will go over the, its parts in more detail in the next slides so to explain the contribution of these parts. On this slide, I just want to point out some similarities to Siminian. Namely, here on the top, we have the, the um, uh, more expensive permutation, which we call the body of the Hydra. And the output here, Y and Z, is then fed into uh, cheaper permutations, which we call the heads of the Hydra. And uh, similar to Siminian, the outputs of these cheaper permutations are then used as a key stream to encrypt the actual um, plain text. So how is the, the body constructed? So you can see in the, on the top left, the input of the body is a nonce and an IV, which, is, uh, which are um, four um, uh, final field elements. It is first, uh, we have a key addition here, and then we they, uh, have an expensive permutation, which we call the body. And the output of the permutation, we also have a key addition there. So since we have a key addition before and after the body, <coughs> this whole st uh, structure becomes an even Mansur construction, and that uh, gives us the the property that as long as we design this permutation as a pseudo-random permutation, the output is um, provably secure uh, until the birthday bound. So in other words, what that means is that um, from the point of view of an attacker, this output Y here is neither uh, known nor is it controllable by an attacker. And uh, this already limits the, the number, uh, the poten uh, high, highly um, limits the potential attacks that an attacker can apply on the heads of the Hydra. So similar to Siminian, that allows us to instantiate the heads of the Hydra in a more efficient way, and we get the same property that um, the more uh, data we actually encrypt with Hydra, the, um, the more efficient the encryption gets, and the uh, expensive permutation in the body is amortized over a large number of encryption. So when we now uh, transition to the heads, as I said before, since we are using an uh, even Mansur construction, the attacker cannot control the output of the, of the, of the body. And uh, this already limits um, the, the attacks that we can apply on the heads. So um, the main uh, focus on the security analysis on the heads will be of algebraic nature. And in our analysis, we find that the criminal basis attack will be the strongest attack factor. And uh, simplified spoken, the criminal basis attack uh, gets prevented if we have a high degree in the representation of the heads and if we have a lot of unknown variables there. So in Siminian, they have a very nice trick to increase the number of unknown variables for the attacker to make the, the heads uh, even more uh, uh, cheaper, even more efficient, and that is where this expensive key schedule comes into place. So since the, the, the round keys are extracted from the, from the master key by a very expensive hash function, um, the attacker cannot really model the relation between the round keys and the master keys in, the, in its equation system and is forced to treat each round key as an independent variable. That uh, increases the number of variables in the, uh, in the equation system, uh, the, and the heads uh, um, basically are stronger against the criminal basis attack, and you need a, a, a less number of rounds or a cheaper permutation to prevent this criminal basis attack. So in Megaphono, we want to do something um, different. So we want to achieve basically the same, but without this expensive key schedule. And what we came up with was that we, in the body here, uh, after each round in the permutation, we want to reuse the state of this round to construct a new variable at the output. So what we do here is um, we take the state after each round of the permutation, sum up these states, and come up with um, the new variable which we call set here on the output. And since we designed this body as a pseudo-random permutation, the relationship between uh, Y, K, and Z is highly expensive, and the attacker can also not use this to, to reduce the number of variables in the equation system. So again, the attacker is forced to treat the output Z as independent variables, so um, the heads are, uh, have now um, more variables, and uh, they are um, 
better protect you against the criminal basis attack. So basically, we get the same thing as in Seminion, but without this highly expensive key scheduler. And the, the sum here, um, uh, since in the MPC protocols that we target, the main cost is related to the number of multiplication, and uh, the sum is basically free here, we get these additional variables for free without increasing the cost metric. So now let's look at the heads of the Hydra. So here we have the outputs of the body, which are the variables y and z, and they are now fed into multiple heads here. And uh, as I said before, the main goal that we have here in the, the heads is preventing algebraic attacks. So um, and we also want to, to have as many variables as possible in this equation system. So on one hand, to get the key into the equation system spec, uh, we instantiate the, the uh, permutation uh, B hat here as a keyed permutation. So basically, we add the, the master key after each round of the permutation. So the attacker has to, to consider the key as well here in the equation systems of the head. And on the other hand, um, one valid strategy for an attacker could be uh, just attacking the heads and uh, discarding the, the body completely. So uh, he could, uh, for example, take the output from one hand ahead and go via the two heads to the output of another one. And uh, by constructing this equation system, he could actually cancel out the contribution of Y and Z here in these uh, equations. So what we do here to prevent this is by actually having this feed forward addition uh, around this uh, head permutation. And with that, we prevent an attacker can cancel out Y and Z to probably, uh, probably produce cheaper equation systems. Um, another thing that uh, we usually have to consider here is so um, we obviously want to uh, make it impossible to prevent the, the permutations in the head, uh, prevent inverting the permutations in the head. So in Seminian, this is done via truncating the output. Here in uh, Hydra, since we already have a keyed permutation in the head and this feed forward addition, inverting the permutation is already prevented. And that uh, without the truncation. So overall, compared to Seminian, since we do not discard any valuable um, key stream, elements here on the output, we get a higher throughput here as well. And another thing I want to mention here is um, before the, the, uh, the head permutation, we have this rolling function here, ri, and this is basically to, to uh, modify the inputs to the head so that we get a different um, a key stream in the end, and uh, we instantiate it also as a um, nonlinear function here to frustrate these uh, mid-in-the-middle attacks among multiple heads even further. Okay, so far about the construction. Now I want to talk a little bit about how we instantiate this megafono design strategy to get the BRF Hydra. So um, for the body permutation, we basically instantiate it with the Hades design strategy. So here we have uh, two different round functions uh, with the two different purposes here. The ex so-called external rounds are there to prevent um, statistical attacks in the head. And here we basically use the same thing as in Hades MIMC. Namely, we have a cheap MDS matrix and uh, use uh, um, simple power maps as the nonlinear layer. So this was already done before in Hades MIMC. For the internal rounds, uh, here we uh, only want to protect against algebraic attacks. And in Hades MIMC there, they use also a version of the, uh, of the power map. In Hydra, we use something different. Namely, we use um, a generalized version of the Lemessi construction. And you see one variant here on the slides. So the Lemessi construction is very cheap. So here with this version, you can see for the input state, we take a weighted sum, produce one square, and add it to the whole input to get the output state. So overall, one nonlinear layer is only, uh, only requires one multiplication here. And as we show in the paper, it's uh, significantly more efficient than the Bauer map to reach a suffic sufficiently high algebraic degree for uh, the security of the cipher. And um, since the uh, generalized Lemessi construction is known to uh, be susceptible to invariant subspace trails, we have a linear layer in these uh, internal rounds that prevents these subspace trails. And uh, in the paper, we show how we can construct a very cheap matrix that uh, fulfills this goals, goal. So in the head of the Hydra, since we basically also only care about algebraic attacks, we instantiate it with something very similar to the internal rounds of the body, so it is also uh, instantiated with a version of the generous Lemessi and the same matrix to prevent the subspace trails. And also in the rolling function, we, we do something very similar here. So that gives us, uh, with our security analysis, for the, um, for the external rounds in the body, we basically need six rounds. That is uh, the same as in Hades MIMC. For the internal rounds, the, so the generous Lemessi, 
function we need 42 internal rounds and compare when we compare this to Hades memes which has power maps which basically needs the same number of multiplication than our layer we can see that we have a significantly smaller number of rounds and for the heads um, here we have the uh, we get 39 rounds for security here so when we have a look at um, the total number of multiplications in our design for uh, encrypting a specific number of uh, plain text words, so these plain text words are final field elements, you can see when we consider key schedules uh, in the other designs, then we can see that the Hydra is by far the most efficient BRF in the MPC setting, and you can see that the gap is really big to, to other symmetric designs here as well. Only Hades MIMC is uh, um, kind of competitive here. So when we um, have a look at the total number of multiplications when we discard the key schedule, so we don't compute it in MPC. So this is basically the setting where uh, um, Ciminian was uh, designed for. And then you can see that uh, Ciminian is now significant, significantly more competitive than the, the, the remaining BRFs. And you can see that for a small number of plain text words, Ciminian is actually a little bit more uh, efficient than Hydra, but uh, Hydra scales significantly better, and the more we encrypt, the more efficient Hydra gets, and the gaps widens here at the end, and um, Hydra is then, again, the most efficient BRF in this setting. So in the paper, we also performed some benchmarks in a real MPC library, so we were using the MP Speeds library for that, but I refer you uh, to the paper for the concrete benchmarks. Basically, to summarize, um, it uh, uh, gives us exactly what we expect from the previous slide. So when we have to compute key schedules, no other BRF comes close to the performance of Hydra, and when we don't compute key schedules, then Ciminian uh, is uh, slightly more efficient for small states, uh, for small plain text sizes, but uh, here Hydra becomes more efficient the larger the number of plain text gets. And if you're interested in it, um, here we have um, published our implementation framework, so if you're interested in it, just have a look at, the, at this repository. So to summarize, in this talk we came up with a new design strategy which we call Megafono. It's uh, um, uh, based on a Fafala design strategy and it is modified uh, to, to be more efficient in MPC without key schedules. We've instantiated it to create the PRF Hydra and it's basically an efficient and secure variant of Ciminian without the need of an expensive key schedule. So we have minimized the multiplicative complexity and we have shown that the, uh, right now that the most efficient PRF in this uh, MPC setting. So uh, for more details about the security analysis and also about the benchmarks, I would refer you to the paper, which you can find on Inkprint with this link. And as for any new symmetric design, I highly welcome the community to, to try to find some attacks that we did not consider. Thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Thanks, Roman. <laughs> any questions for Roman? I see Leo coming down already. That's dramatic. Uh, could you go back to slide uh, 12? <coughs> oh, sorry. Yes? One with the, yeah. Uh, could you elaborate on what's being compared here? So uh, basically on the y-axis we have the number of multiplications that yeah. we have to uh, compute an encryption with these uh, encryption schemes here. And on the x-axis we have the number of plain text that we want to encrypt. And uh, so here, um, for example, on... Uh, then, plain text words, we see that uh, Hydra is a slightly more efficient than Hades MIMC, and uh, yeah, for the, yeah, uh, so basically a number of multiplications, yeah. But you're comparing PRF with a block cipher, so is it like a block cipher with a huge block size, or is it a block cipher in yeah, yeah, so, mode, or? So, so for uh, Hades MIMC, Rescue, uh, G MIMC, et cetera, we, we just increase the block size. So you okay. can see in, um, in Hades MIMC, this leads to more efficient constructions because the round number doesn't change when you uh, increase the block size, but uh, you have less multiplications in the internal rounds. So this is actually, for example, for Hades MIMC, the, the, the best setting. But that's not how you would construct a PRF from a block cipher. Uh, well, how would you do it? Well, just increasing the block cipher. Well, anyway, we can probably take it offline. Yeah. So, so um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Any more questions for Roman? Well, let me ask you another question. Um, so NIST is um, considering to start a process to standardize threshold MPC-friendly crypto, including semantic encryption. So would you consider submitting Hydra there? Uh, do you think there's big improvements still possible? 
Most so um, in general, I think it would make sense to submit it there if there's a call for um, encrypting with, uh, uh, in MPC for potentially large amounts of data. So in that sense, I would say it makes sense, yeah. So potential improvements. So um, uh, the main focus we, we had here when we did the security analysis was on the uh, heads of the uh, Hydra, so potentially we, one can come up with some more efficient uh, constructions in the body. So here we mainly relied on uh, what was done in the Hades MIMC before, but if we have some improvements there. But uh, if uh, there's a call which directly calls for encrypting large amounts of data, then uh, sure, we can consider that there. Yeah. Okay, I see no more questions. So join me in thanking Roman again. Okay, so next up on deck, we have the paper coefficient grouping, uh, breaking jaggery and more. The authors are Fukang Lui, Ravi Anand, Libo Wang, Willy Meyer and Takenori Sobe. Right, and then. Fukang is going to give the talk. So, thank, <coughs> thanks for introduction. In this talk, I will describe our work on how to break Chagli, the FHE friendly cipher Chagli, and how to rescue it with our technique called coefficient grouping. So this is the outline of this talk. Let us start. So Chagli is an FHE-friendly block cipher proposed recently at ACMCC 2022. Uh, it's defined over a large finite fit, F2263. So although it's not a large prime fit, it's an extension fit of characteristic two. So it generally follows the SPN structure, and uh, the input is composed of three uh, state words, where each state word is an element in the field F2 to the 63. Uh, the S box is sim it's a simple power map, and the exponent is 2 to the 32 plus 1, and then there is uh, a fine transform uh, defined by the uh, F2 linearized polynomial at Bx, and uh, then there is a MDS matrix, and then key addition and constant addition. The designers did not specify the concrete choice of M, but our the time complexity of our attacks also is not affected by the concrete choice of M, so it works for any choice of M. So we indeed bre bre broke Chagli in less than three weeks after its publication on ePrint, and uh, our technique is the high-order differential attack. So what we need to do is to upbound the algebra degree. We tried three different words, although in this paper we only describe the, the general method called coefficient grouping. And uh, this technique is highly related to our method, method two. And uh, you, I, you will see it later, because, because the first two methods are too dedicated for Chagli. We want, it's not elegant enough, so we want to do more. So, and uh, uh, based on our understanding of the coefficient grouping technique, we finally figured out where the problem is, and uh, proposed the condemnier, and the designers also use this condemnier. The problem is uh, the B is too sparse, so we propose to use a denser one. So to understand our technique, it's necessary to first have some basic knowledge for the finite fit, F P to the N, where P is a prime number and N is an uh, a positive integer. So for the elements uh, in a finite fit, there are some different representations. We use the uh, representation based on polynomial basis. Uh, specifically, for, with, with, the, with a polynomial basis, each element in the field can be uniquely represented by a vector of length n, and uh, each element in the vector is a non-negative integer, modular p, modular p. And we also have some well-known properties for the finite fit, and you can easily find the, all of them in many textbooks. Yeah. So our attack, our technique is the high-order differential attack over F2 to the M. So, but maybe this attack is mostly uh, done for ciphers over F2. Maybe so. Yeah. So we need to first briefly introduce it. So. The most important part is how to define the algebraic degree of a univariate polynomial in the polynomial ring F2 to the M. 
uh, in a word, we can say the degree, the algebraic degree of the of such a polynomial is the uh, maximal Hamming weight of the exponents in all possible non-zero monomials. I mean, so for example, if we check this uh, polynomial f, then we can say uh, its algebraic degree is three because for the first monomial, the Hamming weight of the exponent is two. For the second monomial, the Hamming weight of the exponent is three. So the maximum one is three. And uh, after we have this definition, we can, yeah, if we know the algebraic degree of the polynomial, then we can easily uh, mount a high order differential attack. We only need to have, uh, choose a, a subspace whose dimension is larger than df plus one, and then we, yeah, we, we evaluate the f over this set of inputs, and the sum will be zero. Indeed, this is the, uh, although these are well known in mathematics, it was only uh, recently used for cryptanalysis, especially this was first done uh, on Mimic, and uh, the, attack, the, attack, the attack is very efficient because uh, in Mimic, the, they use a very, uh, I mean, the, the power map, the, the degree is very small, it's only three. So they showed that the algebraic degree increased linearly, and you can see uh, it indeed increased very, in a very slow way. But if we use a more a general power map whose exponent is 2 to the d plus 1, if we again use this a similar idea, we can see the bound is not, it's not accurate at all, especially in Chagli, d is 32. And we cannot even break two rounds of Chagli with this simple method. So that's why we developed our technique. So as I said, we have three methods, but I will skip method one because it's not so relevant to our discovery of the coefficient grouping technique. So, but method two is very important. So let us record, this is the definition of the S-box and the affine polynomial in Chagli. And for convenience, we denote the three input state words of Chagli by Z01, Z02, Z03, and we denote the state after R rounds by ZR1, ZR2, ZR3. So our, this is our very naive idea. So first, we set the input as a univariant polynomial in the variable X. So you can see this is a linear polynomial, all linear polynomial. And uh, then we can know after any number of rounds, each, each state word will be a univariant polynomial in X because we only have one variable X. Then what we need to do is to trace how the polynomial representing the internal state evolves through the round function. And then step three, yeah, very naively we compute all possible exponents of this in this polynomial. And uh, according to the definition of the algebraic, we, what we need to do is to find the exponent uh, from this set uh, with the maximal Hamming weight. Of course, you should know immediately step three cannot work for large R because yeah, too many monomials as R increases. And to do this, to trace the evolution of the polynomials, we need to have a more uh, general representation of the univariant polynomial for, uh, for the internal state R the RI the specifically, we can introduce a set WR, uh, and uh, it denotes the, the it denotes all possible exponents that will appear in the polynomial representation in R in the R1, the R2, the R3. In this way, so the R1, the R2, the R3 can all, can be represented in the same way, and then we can trace how this representation evolves through the S box and the the fine transform BFs. First, the S box. According to uh, what I say is the real known property for the final feed, we can easily compute this, how, how it evolves through S. And we can get, again, so this is very beautiful, so very simple. The exponent, yeah, it's very beautiful. And again, through BX, yeah, very simple mathematics here. And uh, we will get, again, a very structured uh, polynomial representation for the. Uh, for the internal state. And uh, for the matrix multiplication, it only affects the 
coefficients of the polynomials, it will not introduce additional, I mean, it will not introduce new monomials in the, in the, yeah, in the <laughs> original polynomial. So, so we can say, so we can see, we can say uh, the state after one round of permutation, uh, I mean the, the, the polynomial representation of the state after one round will be in this way. So it's identically, it's identical to this representation because matrix M does not affect it. So, so based on this uh, representation, we can know the relation between the set WR and WR plus one. And uh, since we are working on the polynomial ring, we have to consider the exponent uh, modular two to the m min two to the sixty three minus one. This is and uh, of course, if the exponent is exactly two to the thirty three minus one, it should be. Uh, we should not do the modular addition. This is based on these two properties, and this is why we define the function m m. So now we have know the relation between. R, WR and WR plus one. In other words, we can uh, represent WR, uh, WR in terms of the uh, in terms of variables uh, in the set WR. And uh, why we consider WR plus two? Because yeah, in Chargali, the, the designers treat two rounds as one big round. So that's why we consider WR plus two. And you will find later this is very important for our coefficient grouping technique. So, for we can because we know the relation between WR and WR plus one. We we also know the relation between WR plus two and WR plus one. And then we further replace the WR plus one uh, in WR. So it's just like this. So here and here. And then we can get the relation between the set WR plus two and the set of WR. And we know, note that our initial input polynomial is AX plus B. So the, the set of exponents is only, are only zero and one. And so we can, we also know the relation of WR and WR plus two. So we can, oh, we can simply compute W2, W4, W6, W8 by yeah, naive enumeration. Of course, it will become impractical, even for small r. Yeah. So this is, in our method two, we observed that for the concrete choice of the S-box of the polynomial S and the affine polynomial B and the, uh, the, the size of finite field F uh, 2 to the 6, 3, we indeed can split, we can indeed can use two smaller sets to describe the set WR, and uh, the two Smaller sets can be computed independent, but this is highly relate, uh, related to the concrete choice of S and B. So it's not general, but amazingly we can do this for up to 16 rounds. So, and we know a chocolate has only 16 rounds. So we can break it with method two, and we get the up round is uh, 37, and so with the time complexity to construct the distinguisher is two to the 38, but yeah not elegant enough because, why? Uh, because it's too dedicated for Chagli. So we are motivated, so we developed the coefficient grouping technique. We are mainly motivated by the three problems. First, do we really need to compute the set WR round by round? And uh, second, the method is not beautiful. I mean, a little ugly, I mean. <laughs> so, uh, so we want to have uh, a more elegant and a general method for a more general construction where the S box is in this way and the B is in this, in this form and uh, we also work for uh, a, a general final field F2 to the N. So indeed, the idea is the same. We set the input polynomial as AX plus B and then we trace, we introduce the set WR to uh, represent uh, all possible exponents uh, that will appear in the polynomial representation of the internal state ZR1, ZR2, ZR3. And then we trace how the set evolves through the round function. That's how we get the relation between the set uh, for WR plus one and WR. Uh, it's indeed the same. We only 
So only the changes here, we replace the original K0, K1, K2, uh, because in Chagli, K0, I think, is 32. K1 is 0. K2 is 3. So now we only treat them as variables. So, and similarly, we can get the representation of WR plus 2 in terms of WR. And uh, if you do this for WR plus 3, again, we can also uh, represent WR plus 3 in terms of WR. And uh, they have a very beautiful, uh, I mean, structure. Specifically, if you do this for WR plus 3, WR plus 4, you will see they all have the same form where there is a number. Uh, the number is 2 to the power, 2 to the i, and then it's followed, it's, it will be multiplied by a certain number of variables belonging to the set WR. And, and we can specify the concrete number of variables for each such uh, number. And we, we can, for convenience, we can say, uh, because we are considering the polynomial in the polynomial ring f2 to the n, uh, so, oh, I mean, oh, so this, I mean, uh, these numbers can only be uh, 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 3, until 2 to the n minus 1. And uh, we can, we can, so we can, for this representation, we can see uh, there are nj variables uh, that will be multiplied with the number 2 to the power j, and uh, we say we group these variables. This is why we uh, name this technique. And uh, in this way, uh, wr plus l can be fully described with a set of a vector of integers n and the set wr. I mean, n exactly means the number of variables for each term to the j. And uh, for, for w0, we know it is 0, 1. If we represent it with our new representation, then the, the, this vector of integers will be 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Because, yeah, in this representation, on, we only, only for, the, for the integer 2 to the power 0, there is one variable, so this is 1. But for the remaining 2 to the power 1, no variable, so it's 0. And according to the relation between WR and WR plus 1, we can get a very, we can note, we can e easily check how the number of variables, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, how to, how the, how, how we can, I mean, how the vector of integers used to describe the set WR evolves. I mean, we can get, we can compute the uh, vector of integers in linear time to, uh, to describe WR based on this simple recursive relation. So now we know that we can compute the vector uh, used to represent uh, WR in linear time, and uh, we can set, uh, we, ca we can relate WR uh, with W0, and the, 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 the number of, in the, the vector of integers can be uh, computed in linear time, so we get this representation. But it's not, it's still not over because yeah, it's still not uh, intuitive. So what we do is we can see that for each such term, for, e for, each, for each such part, we can see that its, it's, in its value is indeed in this set. So what we so based on this observation, we can use another representation of the set WR, and it's very beautiful. So it's just like this. So what we need to do is to, so note that our goal is to find the maximal Hamming weight of the element in the set WR. So we can further reduce this into a optimizing problem. So this is our, uh, what we need to maximize. And they have, and these variables should satisfy these constraints. Of, in this paper, we solve this optimization problem with blackboard solvers. But intuitive, I have the intuition, I have an, there should be an efficient algorithm for this real structure op optimization problem. And I did find it and prove the correctness of it. And it works in linear time. So now everything works in linear time. It means we can upper bound the algebra degree in linear time for this special uh, cipher. 
and uh, we can see the, for Chagli, the algebraic degree increased linearly, and we can yeah, attack for 26 runs. And uh, yeah, if we know, carefully look into the coefficient grouping technique, we can see the main problem is caused by the sparsity of B. So yeah, it's more, of course this requires significant additional work. You can check it in our paper, and uh, indeed, uh, we did uh, make some new progress uh, for the coefficient grouping technique uh, for complex B. So in concluding, we developed an efficient degree evaluation technique in linear time for a special SPN ciphers over F2 to the M. And uh, it indicates that we should be careful of such designs over a large finite fit. And there's always an open problem, so many, I mean, he, Christine opened a new direction so in this field, and uh, we have many such ciphers. And uh, the, main, the open problem is how to develop other cryptanalytic techniques for these types of ciphers over a large finite fit. So that's all, thank you. Thank you. Right, we have time for a, a quick question. It seems a question is running. Awesome. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. Um, you, you propose to change from a, a polynomial that is passed with only one uh, coefficient that takes x, that is in fact equivalent to some just alpha x plus c, actually, if you just apply the probenus, and then what you propose is to uh, have four terms in the polynomial uh, as a contour measure for the degree expansion. Do you think uh, if you only have two terms uh, that contains x in the linear polynomial, it already frustrates the increasing of the degree? Or do you have something if it's sparse? I mean, you go from one to four, is there something in between? Are you mean the sparsity of b? Yes, the sparsity yeah, of b. Yeah, we did some work, and uh, I think you will find it later. <laughs> we will publish it later. Yeah, okay. we did find something. OK, yeah. thanks. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. Then uh, let's thank Fuka again. Thank you. And last but not least, um, the third paper is Pitfalls and Shortcomings for Decompositions and Alignment. And the authors are Baptiste uh, Lambin, uh, Gregor Leander, and Patrick Neumann. And uh, Patrick is going to give the talk. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, let me directly start with uh, explaining what I mean if I talk about decomposition. Um, here I mean that uh, we decompose a function into a linear layer L1, a parallel application of multiple S-boxes SI, and another linear layer L2. And um, as you might know, we are actually quite used to uh, this description of a round function as of a cipher. So many of our ciphers are actually described in this way. And um, then we may actually base uh, security arguments on such a decomposition. For example, let's say we want to count uh, the number of active Xboxes to uh, bound the probability of um, a differential characteristic. So in this example, let's just say that we have two active Xboxes, S1 and S2. Um, but then the question is, what happens if we actually um, have another decomposition? So what potentially can happen is uh, that we just get a different result, right? So let's say in this example, we only would get one active S-box, and therefore we would uh, underestimate the prob probability of our differential. So the question we ask ourselves is, when can this happen? When can we actually get uh, multiple decompositions. Or put slightly differently, um, our question is when is a decomposition unique? And of course there are well known uh, limitations, to, uh, limitations to the uniqueness of a decomposition. The first one is uh, that you can always reorder your S boxes. So in this example uh, we change the position of S2 and S1, but uh, you can easily adjust for this by um, changing the linear layer. So in this example, the new linear layer would be what's indicated by the uh, blue boxes. And uh, another thing you can always do is you can look at linear equivalent S-boxes. 
So you would take uh, linear transformations, AI and BI, and then your new S boxes become what's uh, indicated by the green boxes. And again, you can account for this by adjusting your linear layer. And uh, again, the blue boxes give you the new linear layers. Um, the last thing you can also always do is just combining S boxes. So here, uh, I have combined S2 and S3 into one big S box that's also always possible. So um, our question actually becomes, when is the decomposition unique up to those uh, limitations? And before I give you the result, I need uh, two short definitions. The first one is about maximal differential uniformity and says that a function has maximal differential uniformity if we uh, can find a non-zero alpha and beta such that this equation here holds for all x. And similarly, we uh, need a definition of maximal linearity. And this just states that a function has maximal linearity um, if we can find a non-zero alpha such that the inner product with alpha and f is an affine function. And uh, with that, our main result becomes that a decomposition is not unique if and only if one of the S-boxes has maximal differential uniformity and another one has maximal linearity. That's actually quite nice because um, for all cryptographically strong S-boxes, we now know that such a decomposition is actually unique, of course, again, up to those limitations I showed you. And um, as a side note, this also shows that if we are, giving, uh, if we are given one decomposition, then we can easily check if it's actually unique by um, just comp uh, computing the maximal differential uniformity and linearity of the S-boxes and um, where we, we are computing the uniformity and the linearity and if they are both not maximal, then we know that uh, the deco decomposition is actually unique. Okay, so let uh, me actually show what can go wrong, why we could actually end up with multiple decompositions in case that uh, one S-box has maximal differential uniformity and another one has maximal linearity. Um, for this, we need uh, two lemmata. The first one being that uh, functions with maximal differential uniformity are linear equivalent to functions of this form. And I think it's actually already easy to see that this function has maximal differential uniformity, but because you can just uh, add a difference in y and get the same difference at the output, no, no matter at the input. And for the other direction, um, I want to at least give you the idea how it works. Uh, we just remember that uh, F having maximal differential uni uniformity means that we can find uh, non-zero alpha and beta, such that uh, this equation holds. And then all we have to do is linearly transform F into G such that uh, alpha and beta both correspond to the last bit and we call the last bit y. Okay, now the second lemma we need is that functions with maximal linearity uh, are affine equivalent to functions of this form. And again, here we, we can just uh, use the, or look at the first coordinate function and see that this function um, would indeed have maximal linearity and again, for the other direction, we um, use a quite uh, similar approach. So again, we call that F has maximal lin linearity. If we can find non-zero alpha, beta, and a constant C, such that uh, this equation here holds. And then first, we uh, get rid of the constant C by adding F of zero to F. So now the function is just linear. And uh, then, again, we linearly transform uh, this function into H in such a way that alpha and beta now both become the vector that is one in the first coordinate and uh, zero otherwise. Okay, with those two lemmata, we can actually restate our main result um, in functions without a unique decomposition are exactly those that are affine equivalent to functions of such a form. And here, the first part corresponds to the S-box with maximal differential uniformity, and the second part to the one with maximal linearity. And in case we have more than two S-boxes, then we just now see them as part of uh, one of those two S-boxes. 
And what uh, now can happen is that we can, at the input side, add uh, x3 to x2, but we also know x3 at the output, so we can basically revert this operation and uh, eff effectively do not change anything. And uh, in, in terms of linear transformations, this would actually look like this. So effectively, we started with two linear layers that are basically the identity. That's why they are not really shown here. And we ended up with uh, two different linear layers. So this shows that, uh, that we actually have two decompositions, so the uh, decomposition cannot be unique. And uh, for the other direction, I would have liked to, to show it to you in this presentation, but unfortunately, I don't have enough time for this. So um, if you are interested, then please go, have, uh, go ahead and uh, have a look at the paper. Okay, then uh, some remarks on the uniqueness of decompositions. There's actually an example in literature without a unique uh, decomposition. That's the cipher default. And another remark is that we now know that we have to be careful if S boxes with maximal differential uniformity and linearity are used, or even if they just can be used. And um, to see where this is or why this is important, uh, let's has, have a look at alignment. Alignment is this mysterious property that has both positive and negative connotations. And uh, until recently, was not even formally def uh, defined. That uh, just changed very recently at Crypto 21. And informally speaking, um, alignment just means that two rounds decompose with at least two S boxes. And to avoid confusion, I will um, call this S boxes super boxes as this is quite commonly done. Okay, so now let's look at. Uh, First, the definition of alignment, and after that, the impact of alignment. So here I uh, depicted two rounds, and I left out the uh, linear layer before for the first Xbox layer, and the linear layer after the second Xbox layer, as they are just not important for alignment. And uh, as you can see, we have four S-boxes, and the input and output of these S-boxes is split into two parts. That's uh, just to depict the linear layer. And uh, as indicated by the colors, everything that's colored in blue only depends on things that are colored in blue, and everything that's colored in green only depends on things that are colored in green. So actually, you see we have two independent parts, so two independent, uh, two super boxes, and therefore this uh, structure is aligned. But then what happens if uh, we actually mix those colors, so we add this addition here, um, that's highlighted in red. Then actually, if we were to look at the uh, definition of alignment, we would find out that this mixing of colors actually makes the structure unaligned. Well, but um, then what's happen what happens if we look at a more specific S-box? So basically, some uh, Feistel-inspired S-box. Well, then we see that um, this addition we added actually commutes with the last uh, S-box layer. So we can move it out of there, and as I already said, um, for alignment we are not interested in any linear transformation after the second S-box layer, so we can remove it, and we are where we started at, so this function would actually be aligned and unaligned at the same time. And um, the reason why this happens is that uh, the round function or the decomposition of the round function is actually not unique, and uh, that's why we were able to uh, compute the, um, this addition with the S-box layer. And um, how to fix this would actually be to just uh, use the definition I gave you informally as the real definition of alignment, so just checking if two rounds decompose into uh, at least two superboxes. Okay, so let's also look at the impact of alignment. At the uh, Crypto 21 work, the authors also looked at uh, aligned and unaligned ciphers. And they infer that alignment might lead to uh, bigger clustering effects. So as an example, here's the cumulative uh, histogram 
of the number of differentials of a given weight over two rounds. And um, the important things to note here is that Zudu is the pr only primitive that is unaligned, the other two are aligned, and um, also the results look very differently. Um, but then we ask ourselves, is this really um, an effect of alignment or is this maybe due to other properties of the ciphers? So what we did is we took present and changed the bit permutation of present. Um, as uh, by doing so, we can nicely produce aligned versions of present, but also unaligned versions of uh, present while preserving things like uh, full diffusion after three rounds, but also all weight one to weight one um, linear trails, as this uh, should pretty much keep the uh, properties with respect to linear crypt analysis uh, yeah, around the same. So let's look at the uh, um, same graph, but for present, or the different variants of present here, colored in red, is the original version of present that is actually aligned. And then in blue, there are multiple unaligned versions of present. And again, the important thing to note here is that now the uh, versions actually um, behave pretty much the same. And that's actually our overall result of our experiments. In uh, all experiments we, we did, we found that uh, all variants behave the same in all aspects or nearly the same. So to conclude, we have found that under some wild conditions, uh, a decomposition is actually unique. That's actually nice because then we can base uh, security arguments on this unique decomposition, but still we have to be careful if those conditions are not met as we have seen uh, with the definition of alignment. And with respect to alignment, we have seen that the impact of alignment to clustering may be overestimated and therefore we think that the benefits of alignment uh, may actually outweigh uh, this impact and by benefits I mean things like uh, using the right trace strategy to, to bound uh, the probability of a differential characteristic as it's done for the AAS. And yes, that's my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. All right, any questions for Patrick? It seems Schill is coming. Thank you for this nice pre presentation. Um, yeah, I, I would like to defend our Crypto 21 paper a little bit. Um, did you try also, so you took present and you made variants with and without alignment. Did you try with a cipher that has an explicit linear exp um, diffusion layer, unlike present? Because I think that's where the differences between aligned and unaligned will, will show. Um, no, we actually only tried for, for present. But I mean, the, the problem is you, you really want to change uh, only alignment or unalignment. And that's actually uh, not that easy, I think. And for present, it was, I think, uh, doable quite, quite nicely. And uh, I'm not sure if that's actually possible for, for every cipher. Yeah, I, I agree. It's not obvious to just change alignment, and yeah. alignment, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, but thank you for your question. All right, any more questions for Patrick? Okay, seems not to be the case. Yeah, then please join me in thanking Patrick and all the speakers of the session. We only have a task switch break and resume in 10 minutes.